For the service today, for the sermon today, I need you to have a partner. Okay? So find a partner. Steve, you can be my partner. There's nobody else up front. It's you and me. Find a partner, one or two of them. I don't feel like you're partnering up. Does everybody have a partner? Shirley, who's your partner? You want to partner with Gary and Michael behind you? Okay, everybody else have a partner? All right. Look at your partner. Does everybody have a partner? Did you guys not obey my instructions? Okay, okay. Brent, who's your partner? Okay, okay. <coughs> Look at your partner. <laughs> no, you can't change your partner. <laughs> okay, this is this is shouted out time. Look at your partner and tell me what you see. <laughs> okay, tell me what what did you see? Mom. Mom. Okay, that's good. Yeah. What else? And Susie, so you, what do you see? I see a beautiful smile. Okay, a beautiful smile. Nice. What else? Shirley. Shirley. <laughs> Get more descriptive. What do you see? Big earrings. Big earrings. Yes, very good. That's, you laugh, but that's what I'm looking for. What else? What do you see? A stellar beard. A stellar beard. Beautiful long hair. Beautiful long hair. A gray mustache. A gray mustache. Uh, I get to look at Steve's beautiful blue eyes, which are popping because of his yeah. blue sweater. Oh. oh no, Courtney, you don't have a partner. She's a partner. You have to have a partner. All right, what else do you see? I'm glad Gary's back here. You're glad Gary's back? Yes, me too. So what do you see? A healthy Gary? A healthy Gary. What else? Pretty long hair. Shoes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pretty long hair. All right. My future. What? <laughs> oh my god. That's brilliant. <laughs> okay. Now, you're going to have your partners. Courtney, if you want to sit where you were sitting, you can. Or if you want to stay there, you can. It doesn't matter. But you need, to, you need to make sure that you have somebody you can partner with through the sermon. Because keep in mind your partner. They're going to be your partner through the sermon. Okay? Okay, Steve, you got it? Okay. All right. Will you pray with me? Once again, oh God, we open ourselves up to your word. We pray for wisdom and understanding. We pray that you will speak clearly to us individually and as a body. Let us not just hear... Let us respond to your word and to your call. Amen. Amen. Well, last week we started a series on the body of Christ. Yeah. And last week we read in Ephesians and Colossians. Do you remember the main idea of the sermon? Who is the head of the church? Jesus. Jesus. God. Jesus. In Colossians 1, 17 and 18, Paul says this, Jesus himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. So that's what we discovered last week. And in these scriptures, we saw that it was laid out pretty clearly that Jesus is in charge of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. We, the church, are the body of Christ, with Jesus as our head. And as a body, as the body of Christ in the world, we must be led by Christ, who is not only the source of our life, but also the master, the Lord of our life. So with that as our foundation, today we are going to move from the body, or the head, to the body. We are the body of Christ. Individually, we are parts, and together we are the body. Individually, we each have a function, and together we do God's work in the world. Now before we jump into our text in 1 Corinthians 12, let me set the context. And I said this last week, but I'm going to mention to you again. Do you remember, are things good or bad in Corinthians when Paul writes this letter? 
Just take a guess. <laughs> Things are not good, right? We talked about it last week. The church was filled with divisions and arguments and lawsuits and immorality and on and on and on. There was confusion about all sorts of things. Marriage, food sacrifice to idols, worship, the Lord's Supper, the resurrection, the gifts from the Spirit. And so when Paul wrote this letter, 1 Corinthians, to the church, he is specifically addressing all these issues. So we come today to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, starting with verse 12. For just as our body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot were to say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God has arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? But as it is, there are many members, and yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the, hand, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Right? You know this. You know how our bodies work. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you all are the body of Christ and individually members of it, and God has appointed in the church apostles, prophets, teachers, deeds of power, gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all of us apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? No. Do we all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? No. But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a more excellent way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of my favorite preachers is Alistair Begg, who's up in Cleveland. And he says this, while we come to God singularly, we do not live in Christ solitarily. Let me say that again. We come to God on our own. We have our own journey. We are saved individually. But we do not live in Christ solitarily. Once we claim Christ, we become something part of much we become we become a part of something much bigger than ourselves. We are a part of the church, a part of the body, a part of a community of believers. We no longer live for ourselves, and we see this in scripture. Most of the New Testament is written to churches. Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Corinthians, Romans, right? You know that, right? That's what those names mean. They're places, churches, that Paul is writing letters to. When we call ourselves a Christian, that means something. It comes with a responsibility to Christ and a responsibility to one another. So Paul comes along and uses this super helpful metaphor of the body of Christ. <clears throat> it's helpful because we understand it, right? It's not complicated. All we have to do is go and stand in front of a mirror to verify that the parts of the body 
are fit together and work together. But since we don't have a mirror, we have our partner, right? And essentially we've got the same things going on for the most part. So look at your friend again. Oh, Susan, your friend left. Your partner left. It's all right. You can help. That you can oh, be with somebody else's partner. I can imagine. <laughs> are there anybody in here who are only noses, or only ears, or only a big toe? No. I could look at my partner Steve and see that he has ears and eyes and a nose and. I assume feet, because he's got shoes on. He's many parts, but one body, one Steve, right? Henry Nouwen did a daily meditation, and it says this, a mosaic consists of thousands of little stones. Some are blue, some are green, some are yellow, some are gold. When we bring our faces close to the mosaic, we can admire the beauty of each stone individually. But as we step back, we can see that all these little stones reveal to us a beautiful picture, telling a story that none of the stones could tell by itself. That is what our life and community is about. Each of us is a stone beautiful in our own right, but together we tell the story. <coughs> together we reveal the face of God to the world. Nobody can say, I make God visible, but together we can say, we make God visible. Community is where humility and glory touch. Our state pastor, Esther Cottrell, puts it this way. It's the theme of Ohio State Ministries. We are better together. Better together. She understands the scripture. She understands what is being said here, that while we might be okay on our own, an elbow is delightful, we are better together. It makes more sense on part of an arm, right? Better together. And that is what the church is. It's not just a group of religious people gathered to enjoy certain mutually desired functions, right? It is a group of people who share the same life, we belong to the same Lord. We are filled with the same Spirit. We are given gifts by the Spirit. And we are intended to function together to change the world for God. We are better together. And this is the body of Christ. So we have to stay connected to one another. We have to work together. We have to live together and serve together. We are a body. Last week we talked about the problem of we, right? Tell your partner, we. We. The problem of we, the problem of we is that we think that we means everybody who is like us. But we is the body of Christ all over the world throughout the ages in all of its glorious diversity and beauty and manifestation and function. Now, Last week, one of the things I said was that as a body, we can function without certain parts. We can function without an arm. We can function without a leg or a foot. But we, we can even function without a kidney. But we can't function without the head, which is Christ. And that's true. And while it may be true, we are held back if we are not all together. Has there anyone ever broken an arm or a leg? Okay. <laughs> when you break an arm, I've never broken an arm, I assume. When you break an arm, it affects more than just the arm part of your body. Is that true? Okay. When something happens in the church, when someone dies, is it just that part of the body that is affected? Or even the parts that are next to it, like the spouse? No. When Sam died, when Richard died, we're all affected by that. 
The body is affected when one member is hurting. But on the flip side of that, what happens when you exercise? Even if it's only leg day, when you exercise, your body feels better. What's that? What's that? <laughs> I don't know, I don't do it. <laughs> it's just an example. <laughs> When you exercise, I know, I see, and this is why it's better without the, the video, because it used to be that nobody ever saw me do stuff like that, but now, except for you guys. Anyway, when we do something good for the body, when we drink lots of water or when we exercise, it affects the whole body. So when something good happens in the church, like when Courtney got custody of the kids, we all rejoice together. It affects the body. We are a part of one another. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in that hurt. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance. What we do, we do together. We are the body of Christ together. So we must say no to isolation and yes to involvement. We must be together together. Being a part of a church is not like joining a club. We're not a social club. We are a body of Christ. We are better together. And there are no dismembered parts of the body. And so when we are missing someone, we are missing them together. When someone is not being used correctly, it affects us all. So if you are part of the body, you have to consider how to function within the body. And how do you do that? by finding your own place. Now, members of the body of Christ possess a diversity of gifts suited to particular functions. Every part, every person, is important to God's kingdom work in the world. And the gifts that we're given are called spiritual <coughs> gifts. They are different from natural talent. Okay? They are different from natural talent. They are different from developed skills. Spiritual gifts are gifts given to God's people as the Holy Spirit works. Now one of the best definitions I've come across is from Bruce Bugby, <coughs> who says this, Spiritual gifts are divine abilities, that's godly abilities, distributed by the Holy Spirit to every believer according to God's design for the body of Christ. Okay? So, godly abilities given out for the good of the body. In our bodies, each part has its place. A hand wouldn't work nearly as well on a shoulder as it does on the end of the arm. We couldn't reach for stuff, right? It wouldn't work there. It is the same with the church. Verse 18 of what we just read in the scripture says this, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. We are arranged, put together for a purpose. The church, the body of Christ, is put together with divine invention. <laughs> Pizza's ready. More pizza. The body of Christ is put together with divine invention. God put us here for a reason. And we work best when we know our gift and use our gift together with the rest of the body. Many years ago, the Saddleback Church in California had grown to about 500 people. And Rick Warren, the senior pastor, said this, Folks, I'm out of energy, and the church is getting so big that I can't do much anymore. As I read the Bible, he said, it doesn't say I'm supposed to do it all anyway, so I'll make you a deal. If you'll do the ministry that God gifted to you, then I'll do my part, which is to make sure that you're fed. And he and the leaders shook hands and made a pact, and it was after then that that ministry began to explode. As we consider our place in the body, as we consider our place in the body, we have to consider 
that God has created us for a purpose. And it is to serve the kingdom. We have to change our focus and our expectations. And I've told you this many, many times. The church doesn't exist for us. We're already here. You're already here. The church exists for those who are not here. And so we've got to change our focus and our question. The question is not, what is the church doing for me? Right? You're already here. The church has done what it needs to do. You're here. So the question is not, what is the church doing for me? The question needs to be, what can I contribute to the church? What part do I play in the body? What gifts do I have to help? So let's talk about these gifts. Gifts are given so that they can be used in service to others and so that God's kingdom will grow. These are gifts that are received, not achieved, right? It's not a skill. It's a given gift. The gifts of grace are given to you so that as each part does its work, the church will be built up. So, what are your spiritual gifts? Do you even know? Does anybody know what their spiritual gifts are? I can start. One of my spiritual gifts is preaching. That's why I do what I do. Anybody else know one of their spiritual gifts? Singing. Okay? Did somebody say something back there? To make people laugh? What an awesome gift. Teaching and explaining. Teaching and explaining. Okay. I can't tell you what your spiritual gifts are. I can tell you what I think they are. But i that's something we have to define for ourselves. You have to talk to God. You have to pray. You have to look at your Bible. You have to explore. There are resources out there. And I will give you those resources if you'd like me to. But the list that we have in 1 Corinthians... Because at the end of our scripture, you remember, it says, apostles, prophets, teachers, deeds of power, healing, assistance, leadership, tongues. Those are all great gifts. It's not, an ex- it, that list is not the only thing that there are lists. There's also lists in Romans 12 and in Ephesians 4. So we have to discover our spiritual gifts. And there are different ways to do that. There are tests you can take online that will ask you questions and help you discover your spiritual gifts. So if you'd like for me to set you up with that so you can figure it out, please let me know. Come and talk to me after the service, and we can figure that out. Because here's here's a promise. And you may be sitting there feeling inadequate, but here's a promise from God. Every single Christian, every believer, has at least one spiritual gift. You are valuable and important and part of the body of Christ for a purpose. So as we work to discover our gifts, and I hope that you will spend time doing that. We can't take time on a Sunday to do that because those kind of tests take forever. But please do it. Figure out where it is that you fit in the body if you don't already know. But this is a note that as we're figuring out those gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit will always promote unity and will never divide. Okay? So as you try to figure out what your gift is, if you're thinking on a gift and it is for the unity of the body and the building up of the body, that's good. That's probably a good sign. If it is divisive, for instance, let me give you a for instance. There are people who say that they have the gift of tongues. But, Scripture is very clear that if there is not someone to interpret, that that is not a true gift. Why? Because it's divisive. Because people don't know what's happening. So, the gifts will always promote unity. So it's important that we each identify our gifts. And again, let me say this once again. If you do not know what your spiritual gifts are, please come and talk to me. We will work together and we will find them because you are gifted in some way by God. And so it's important to identify our gifts. 
While it's important to identify those gifts, it's not enough. Gifts are given to be used. So if Robin were to say, my gift is singing, and then never use that gift for the glory of God, what's happening? What happens with the body? There's a missing part, right? We each have this key role to play in the body of Christ. And we have to identify and then implement our gifts. Because if you are not using your gifts, the entire body is handicapped. If you are not using your gifts, you are a broken arm. So we have to heal and work together. Okay, I want to say two things within this, everybody has a gift thing. And we read in, in the scripture, we're going, to, we're going to look at it once again, but this, this is the first thing. In the body, you are important. So I want you to tell your neighbor, I want you to look at your neighbor in the face and say, you are important. You are important. Okay. Every part of the body is important. Don't underestimate yourself. There is no room in the body for inferiority. Every part is important. Right? Um, I'm going to read this out of the message version because I really like how it says it. When it talks about this in the scripture, it says, I want you to think about how all this makes you more significant, not less. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge, right? We're not all, right, we, we already looked. We looked at each other. There's no noses, there's no ears here. Just noses and just ears. Okay, a body is not a single part blown up into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts <coughs> arranged and functioning together. If a foot said, I'm not elegant like the hand, embellished with rings, I guess I don't belong to this body. Would it make it so? No. And if the ear said, I'm not beautiful like I, expressive and bright, I don't deserve a place on the head, would you want to remove it from the body? If the body was all eye, how could it hear? If it was all ear, how could it smell? And as it is, we see that God has carefully placed each part of the body right where he wanted it. I don't know if you're an ear or an eye or a toe or an arm, but you are an important part of the body. There are no spare parts. There are no spare parts in the body of Christ. No throwaways. God chose you and wants you as part of the body. So there's no room for inferiority because it robs the body of your gifts. Okay, so the first thing is, in the body you are important. But let's be careful because you are not that important. Okay? So tell your neighbor, you are not that important. You are not that important. It's not very nice. It's not very nice. But here's what I mean by this. Here's what I mean by this. Don't overestimate your importance. One of the problems in Corinth is that some of the people thought that they were more important than other people because they had some pretty spectacular gifts. And Paul says, I want you to think about how this keeps your significance from getting blown up into importance, self-importance. For no matter how significant you are, it is only because of what you are a part of. No matter how significant you are, it is only because of what you are a part of. The heart, we think, is probably one of the most important body parts. We can't live without it. But it is only valuable because what of it is a part of. A heart also can't live on its own. Okay? An enormous eye or a gigantic hand wouldn't be a body but a monster. What we have is one body and many parts, each its proper size and in its proper place. No part is important on its own. Can you imagine the eye telling the hand, get lost, I don't need you? Or the head telling the foot, you're fired, your job has been phased out. As a matter of fact, in practice it works the other way. The lower parts, the more basic and therefore more necessary parts, you can live without an eye. 
even though it's beautiful, but not without a stomach, right? When it's a part of your body that you are concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part is vis visible or clothed, higher or lower, you give it dignity and honor just at it, as it is without comparison. Without comparison. There's no room for superiority in the body. No room for inferiority, but no room for superiority. Because superiority robs involvement of others and meaningful fellowship. No matter how significant you are, it is because of what you are part of. So the key to functioning well as the body of Christ is both in assuming our responsibilities, okay, no inferiority, and also understanding our limitations, no superiority. You have to take on your gifts with confidence, but not self-importance. Okay, so we have to identify our gifts, we have to use our gifts, but that's not all. One of the lessons we learn from the church at Corinth is this. Having spiritual gifts does not necessarily make you spiritual. It's possible for a church to have all of the gifts that are needed, and for every believer to know what their gift is, and to still miss the mark. How? Do you guys know what's in 1 Corinthians 13? Love chapter. We hear it at weddings all the time. The last verse of our scripture today, 1 Corinthians 12, says this. There is something far greater. And what he means is love. Because in chapter 12 and in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking about the spiritual gifts. And in between there is the love chapter. Not to be taken out just to be used in weddings. We do it a disservice when we only read that scripture at weddings. Because this love chapter is sandwiched in between these gifts of the Spirit for a reason. Paul recognizes the dangers of using our spiritual gifts divorced from love. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong, gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. <laughs> if I give all that I possess to the poor and surrender my body so that I might boast, but have not love, I gain nothing. After elevating the supremacy of love over every spiritual gift, Paul then describes how love should be the marinade that provides the distinct flavor in our serving. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. Right? You know the scripture. We are to serve as the body with our gifts in love. If we are not ruled by love, then we are missing the mark. Spiritual gifts, no matter how exciting and wonderful, are useless and even destructive if they are not founded in love. I could be the most excellent preacher that there ever was. But if I preach without love for you, it's no good. It can hurt you. It's no good. We have to found our gifts in love. Church, we are to be loved to the world. And all of our gifts are covered in that. That is something we are all given to give away. Church, we need each other. The body is unity and diversity. We are one while having our own individual gifts and talents and skills, okay? We need each other. We must live in mutual dependence as members of the body with Christ as our head. Our effectiveness of, as a body is directly related to our connectedness with Christ and with one another. 
when I was little, um, my family would travel around. We were missionaries. Uh, my parents were missionaries. Um, and we would travel around and sing at different churches. And one of the songs we sang, um, do, does anybody remember Salty, the singing songbook? And it's Salty spelled like P-S, like the Psalms. No, nobody's ever heard of Salty? Oh my. <laughs> Go look him up. He's, he's a singing songbook, okay, um, who has a family, and they go on these fantastic adventures and sing songs to one another. So anyway, we grew up touring around churches, and one of the songs we sang is called The Body Song. And The Body Song talks about the different parts of the body, and so there are five different parts, so each there were five of us, my, my brother, my sister, and my parents. And we would each have a part of the body, and so like we'd be standing across, and I'd be the eye, you know, I was the eye, I, I am the eye, I go blink, blink. Now we're going to hear this song in just a minute, so you'll understand what I'm talking about. And my dad was the heart, and my mom was, I forget which part my mom was, but you know, anyway, you'll see all the parts. And we sang this song, and like it's this silly little song from when I was growing up called The Body Song, but the chorus is exactly what I'm talking about today, because it says, we are the body of Christ, and we work together. And that's this song. So I'm going to share with you this song, and uh, I hope you enjoy it and try to think about my family.